evening. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Welcome to APTN National News. An emergency debate was held in the House of Commons Tuesday night regarding the graves uncovered near a residential school in Kamloops, with opposition parties saying they want to work with government and Indigenous communities for justice and healing. But as Jamie Pashakumskum reports, it wasn't all nonpartisan, as they said two consecutive Liberal governments haven't done enough to fulfill their reconciliation promises. I want us to move beyond just the symbolic gestures and the nice words that this Liberal government has done again and again. We want real action. That is what justice demands. Jagmeet Singh is the one who called this emergency debate, and his sentiment was shared by all opposition parties, even those that don't always prioritize Indigenous issues. That reconciliation requires more than important but only symbolic gestures. It requires action. It requires restoring trust in the federal government and its institutions. And it means building partnerships with Indigenous communities for the well-being of all Canadians. Work with us to move swiftly on calls to action 71 to 76 by Canada Day. Let's have a plan to deliver, to deliver the true potential of this great country for all Canadians. The NDP particularly objected to the Liberals, despite human rights tribunal orders, fighting Indigenous kids and residential school survivors in court. But his government has been slow to act, including on calls to action 71 to 76. And in the midst of this debate, this government is fighting St. Anne's residential school survivors in court. A violent act of having people who underwent the most genocidal violence, still having to prove that violence, even today, this very day, where the remains of 215 children were found in a mass grave. Wednesday morning, federal ministers had a response. They are making $27 million available to communities to pursue further investigations. The money, however, is not new. It comes from the 2019 budget. It needs to be Indigenous-led, community-based survivor-centric in that community, as well as culturally sensitive. So we will be there to support the work in all the communities um, that affected by this, but it will be, we will make sure they have access to whatever expertise they need. But, but it, over the past engagement, it was very clear. They don't want a top-down approach to this. The minister said they will let communities determine courses of action, as these discoveries are not only crime scenes, but sacred sites as well. Jimmy Pashigam, Scum, AP10 National News, Ottawa. The Skowagan Indian Residential School is the only residential school in Saskatchewan that's still standing. Many gathered there yesterday to pay respects to the 215 children found in Kamloops and to acknowledge that more work needs to be done at all residential school sites to uncover unmarked graves. APTN's Priscilla Wolf has that story. of the 215 unmarked graves discovered in British Columbia hit the community of Muskaugan First Nation hard. It brought up many memories for survivors. Cynthia Bejerle says just before the pandemic hit, the community discovered 35 unmarked graves on the Muskaugan Indian Residential School site. In 2018, we did a project with uh, the University of Saskatchewan and Alberta. At, at that time, we didn't even know about ground sonar penetration. And at that time, they came out here because we always knew the history of the school, that there were unmarked graves in our area here. The pandemic put the project on hold. The community held a ceremony for those 35 spirits. So we had a ceremony for our, our st people that we had buried here in the back. They, our elders have told us that there's a lot of areas here that haven't been haven't been explored yet. Holly Geddes, a counselor for Muskaugan First Nation, says she grew up hearing the stories about abuse and unmarked graves, but she didn't want to believe it. All of a sudden, all the stories my grandmother had told me were true. Three days ago, I realized the horror stories she told me were true. And yet at the moment when she was telling me those stories, I'd tell her 
Okay, go cuckoo, don't say that. People aren't like that, that can't be true. I feel guilty, I didn't believe her. I believe her today. The Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations Chief Bobby Cameron says he has the support of the Saskatchewan and federal government to Walk conduct radar ground searches on all the Saskatchewan residential school sites. The work is going to happen on the radar, radar ground searches. It is going to happen. It's going to work. It's going to, we, hope, we hope to get it uh, this week, but if not early next week, we have support from the provincial governments, federal governments. We have the support from our survivors and our chief and councils. We have support from our families. Chief Cameron adds, even though this is a step forward in uncovering the lost children of our residential schools, saving our children in care today is also a priority. We have a lot of work to do to get our children back home from the social services ministry. They're still taking our children from our homes and our communities. Modern day residential school Kidnapping is still happening in First Nation country. And the implementation of Bill C-92, bringing our children home where they rightfully belong. Priscilla Wolf, ab National News, Muskaugan, First Nation. The National Indian Residential School Crisis Line is open for survivors and others who might need support. That number is 1-866-925-4419. Well, the 215 children found buried may have shocked some of the country, but it confirmed what many First Nations communities have long sus suspected. The Kamloops graves were detected by radar technology. Keisha, Keisha Supernaut is the director of the Institute of Prairie and Indigenous Archaeology at the University of Alberta. She spoke with Dennis Ward about what should happen next. Dr. Supernaut, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, you've done similar work with ground penetrating, penetrating radar in other communities. Can you tell us a bit about how it works? I'd be happy to. So ground penetrating radar is a form of remote sensing technology. So a way to look below the surface of the ground without having to dig. And the way in which we do that is there's a small box that has an antenna and we pull that box along the surface of the ground. The, the box sends a signal down into the ground and that signal bounces back differently depending on what's below the surface. So when we're looking for unmarked graves, how the ground penetrating radar actually detects them is the grave shaft itself. So when a grave is dug, the earth is disturbed and the earth will look different from the surrounding soil because of that digging of the grave. And if there is a coffin used, the ground penetrating radar can detect often that coffin as well, but we don't actually see bodies when we use this technology. So the discovery in Kamloops refers to new technology. Have there been advancements in, in recent years with this? There definitely have been refinements of the technology. So ground penetrating radar has been around for a long time and has been used by archeologists, by geophysicists, by forensic folks in a number of different contexts. But a number of things have improved. One is the ways in which we can interpret the data. So we can actually look at what it's showing us in more three-dimensional ways, for example. And we've also done more work on grave sites particularly. So we have more confidence when we actually are locating a possible grave versus say an application in geophysics where you're really just looking for differences in the soil. So those methods have definitely improved and been refined over the past 10 years or so. Has this technology been used to find uh, other sites at residential schools? Yes, uh, I had the honor of being involved with the Muskaugan First Nation, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, and my colleague, Dr. Terry Clark from the University of Saskatchewan. And in those cases, we used ground penetrating radar and located a number of possible burial locations for children associated with that school. And so there have been applications of this also in other parts uh, of the country. What are the cultural protocols that should be taken with this type of work? I think whatever pro 
cultural protocols the community decides upon. So of course we know there's diversity among Indigenous nations across the lands we call Canada and different communities will have specific cultural protocols that are necessary to undertake as we do this work. In the case of the work we did in Muskaugan, we did ceremony and we had um, smudging and things out on the site with us, um, offering a protocol and that kind of thing. But we know that, you know, for example, in other parts of the country, there will be different protocols around what should be taken. But researchers, as well as the community, I strongly feel should be involved in those protocols. When I do this work, it's really essential for me to be able to be part of those ceremonies um, for my own sort of emotional and spiritual well-being while doing this work. That all said, do you have any other concerns with how uh, some of this may move forward now? I think there is a concern right now with how quickly people are going to want to move. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing a lot of calls for doing this investigation at every residential school site. And while I think it's important to resource communities who want to do this, I encourage folks to take a step back and say, are communities ready? Right. Uh, and in many cases, these schools have multiple nations whose, whose children went to them. Right? And all of those different nations need to come together to decide what is the right approach for their school, where their relatives attended. And so I feel like community voices have to be centered here. We have to listen very carefully before we you know, show up with a bunch of equipment at a school site. All that community engagement work, all of that, you know, defining what the protocols are, making sure survivors and their families have the supports that they need because this work is so difficult, it really can be re-traumatizing, bringing this up yet again. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we have to be very careful in the ways in which we approach this work. Dr. Supernote, we'll have to leave it there, but really appreciate uh, your work on this and, and shedding some light on it for us. Thank you so much for having me. Well, following that horrific news out of Kamloops, calls are growing across major cities in Canada for the removal of landmarks and memorials named after Vital Justin Grand Grandin. Uh, he was a Roman Catholic priest and bishop, and according to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report, Grandin believed that First Nations people needed to be, quote, civilized and believed that residential schools was the way to do that. Well, in Winnipeg, a major freeway and a residential area are both named after Grandin. In Alberta, there are several named school, schools named after him, as well as a transit station in Edmonton. Many have come forth to demand a name change, including Calgary Mayor Nahad Nenshi. Uh, Winnipeg Mayor Brian Bowman announced this week that the city is looking to put a historical marker on the Bishop Grandin Boulevard here in Winnipeg that would explain Grandin's role in residential schools, and he said that he's hoping it will open up the conversation to rename the street. Well, truth and reconciliation involves truth. It's the first thing, and so, um, you know, that, that doesn't mean that learning the truth isn't going to be painful or difficult, but we have to continue to make sure that we're, we're properly educating ourselves as Canadians about our, our shared history so that we can figure out what is the best path forward on, a, on, on issues that can move the reconciliation ball forward. Time for us to take a break, but still ahead, we are going to head to the Eshaquan Commission where hundreds gathered as it wraps up. Stay with us. Welcome back to Quebec Now. They shut down the streets to call for justice for Joyce. Hundreds, possibly thousands of people gathered today in Trois-Rivières to mark the official end of the Echequan Commission, the coroner's inquiry examining systemic racism in Quebec's health care system. Our Lindsay Richardson was there. Three weeks of hearings, dozens of testimony heard, and it has culminated to this moment. 1,500 people or more from Manawan and nations all over Quebec gathered together to march peacefully towards the Palais de Justice and cry out justice for Joyce one last time before the Commission's work really begins. He didn't plan to speak, but the crowd gave Kaladzube courage. Everyone is here for Dubé's late wife, Joyce Echequan, 
and to keep up the pressure on those holding power in Quebec. À compter de maintenant, aujourd'hui, c'est la journée, c'est le jour 1 de la fin du racisme, puis c'est le jour 1 du début de la justice pour tous au Québec. C'est comme ça qu'on nous on veut vivre cette journée. And supporters heard that call from far and away. We did a two two days to be here. We took a train and we took a car and uh, it's very important for us to be here with them because it's a, it's a important cases and we have to stop it. I am afraid because I am Inu. I am afraid from uh, the kids. I am afraid from uh, them. Because of a high demand, the Inu community of Iquanishit held a lottery to decide who would attend Wednesday's march. Carrying the flag for the nation, their vice chief had this message. I demand that the government recognize that there is a racist system everywhere, autant chez chez les hôpitaux, mais dans les systèmes des hôpitaux, puis les centres jeunesse également aussi chez nos jeunes, euh, partout, partout. Uh, the Joliette situation is not an isolated situation. It goes far beyond Joliette. And I think uh, it really in the, it's in the hands of the government now to take action. Despite the province's holdout, this group took action of their own, shutting down the main streets <laughs> to drum to sing, to dance, and to heal. And of course, to keep up the cry that's echoed for the last eight months. Over the last three weeks, we've heard accounts of indignity, of humiliation and neglect. The gathering of nations ensures, moving forward, that Joyce Ashaquan will rest with honor. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Trois Rivières, Quebec. A car cross Tagus First Nation woman jailed in Turkey for drug offenses since 2016 is pleading for help today after the Canadian government cut her off financial support. Sharman Smith is serving a prison sentence for drug offenses there. During a press conference today held by the Congress of Aboriginal People, she said the prison shut down due to COVID. Because of this coronavirus, everybody who was in open prison was um, told to, that they could go on their leave of absence from the prison because they didn't want the virus coming in and they wanted to make sure that we we're safe. We had to be first checked by the doctor before leaving the prison to make sure that we didn't have the virus and that we could go out. And I passed the um, medical check and I've been out for a little over a year. Martin says she has epilepsy and she may end up homeless in Turkey if Canada doesn't agree to pay for her expenses while she waits to come home. Global Affairs Canada would not comment on the case. Well, to Alberta now, this week Bradley Barton was scheduled to be sentenced in the death of Cindy Gladue, but Barton's lawyer has filed for a mistrial. The reason behind the mistrial application is under a publication ban. If Justice Stephen Hillier grants the mistrial, Barton would face his third trial in the death of Cindy Gladue. Barton has admitted to causing the injury that led to Gladue's death. Negative First Nations fishery is delayed until further notice. It was supposed to open Thursday, but fishers don't feel safe after last fall's violence in southwestern Nova Scotia. Shpag and Agadee First Nation is still recovering from that violence, those violent attacks last fall when the treaty fishery was launched. Non-Indigenous fishers say the fishery is illegal, traps were cut, property was burned, and the RCMP were criticized for not doing enough to intervene. However, the RCMP say they have an operation plan and are monitoring the situation. Chief Mike Sachs says his community will launch the fishery in a few weeks with their own security. There hasn't been anything that uh, ensures our safety or that we feel comfortable with. So we're going to keep um, keep waiting until we have enough people there to protect ourselves. We need to take one more commercial break. Then we'll tell you about the Edmonton football team's new name. Stay with us.
Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. This was sent in by our viewer, Kelly Pacey. This was his view this morning of the sunrise along the Wilson River that's located just east of Dauphin, Manitoba. Keep those great photos coming. You can email them to us at share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Let's take a look now at tomorrow's weather forecast. We've got sunshine and 20 degrees for St. John's, 25 and sunny in Halifax. Happy Valley Goose Bay, chance of showers, 22 degrees expected. Kujalak showers and 11. Saguenay, 24 and mostly cloudy, but a chance of showers. Gas Bay, 25 degrees, same cloudiness there. 22 in showers for Toronto. Cloud continues up to northern Ontario, 25 in Sault Ste. Marie. Wawa, 19 in showers, 18 in Big Trout Lake. Sunshine, finally, in Manitoba. Thompson, 20 degrees. God's Lake, 17. 32 degrees and cloudy for Winnipeg and same with Dauphin. Sunny in southern Saskatchewan, 36 for Saskatoon, 34 for Regina and Estevan. Mix of sun and cloud and 29 degrees expected for Buffalo Narrows, 21 in showers for Stony Rapids. Lots of cloud up in northern Alberta, 25 in chance of showers for high level, 21 and rain for Fort Chip. Sunny down south though, 31 for Red Deer and Edmonton, 36 for Medicine Hat. 30 for Kamloops, 24 and a chance of showers for Quesnel. 24 and a chance of showers for Fort Nelson too. 16 is the only sunny spot in northern BC. That's at Smithers. Dawson City, 14 with a chance of showers. Old Crow, 13 and mostly cloudy skies. Wrigley, 22 and rain. Yellowknife, 18 and rain. Fort McPherson, 12 degrees and showers there. Tuck to Tuck, 2 and a mix of sunny cloud. Whale Cove, 1 and sunny skies. New Yacht, chance of flurries and zero. Hangertung, 3 degrees with a chance of flurries. Tally Oak, minus 1 and some snow. After years of controversy and debate, Edmonton's CFL team is now called the Edmonton Elks. The new name and logo were revealed yesterday. The rename follows the NFL Washington team who changed their name to eliminate racist stereotypes. Out of seven name options, roughly 40,000 people voted for Elks. Well, still on the sports beat, the final two Canadian hockey teams will square off in the second round of the NHL playoffs tonight. Game one between the Montreal Canadiens and the Winnipeg Jets takes place here in Winnipeg. The team has announced that there will be a moment of silence held to honor the lives of the 215 children lost at the Kamloops Residential School. The Winnipeg Jets have also announced that for the remainder of the Stanley Cup playoffs, the players are going to wear special helmet decals displaying the indigenized Jets logo. It was designed by Letitia Spence from Pima Chickamac Cree Nation. The Montreal Canadiens players will also wear special decals on their helmets with an orange outline around their logo. Nice to see the teams making that gesture. Well, we are all out of time for your news tonight. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Thanks for joining us here. Dennis Ward will be back here on the news desk tomorrow. Have a great night.